This is I Love Black People Radio on HUR Voices, Sirius XM Channel 141. I Love Black People is more than a radio show. I Love Black People is a call from our ancestors to protect us from racial profiling all across the world. Go to iloveblackpeople.com and become a member today. Membership empowers you to live fearlessly and protect black people globally from racism and xenophobia. Join us today and become a member of our global network with an online global green book with black-owned and black-friendly businesses to protect you and your community. Membership is free, and with you, we will become 10 million strong worldwide. I am, because we are. And welcome to I Love Black People. Today, we've been blessed with a wonderful brother putting in the good work for our community in a way that many cities don't even have or even have the resources that they were allocated. This brother is really carrying the load for our community. And we're so blessed to have good brother, Reverend Thomas Bowen. Welcome, brother. Thank you, Brother Skinner. And let me start off by saying I love Black people. Mayor Bowser loves Black people. And everyone in Washington, D.C. owes a debt to Black people. And they ought to love Black people. So you're right. All right. Well, woo, you're starting this thing off right. So humbly, <laughs> with, let our folks know about where all this love is emanating from and kind of give them a, a little background on yourself, uh, good brother, Director Reverend. I come to D.C. Uh, from a small town in Ohio, Mary, Ohio, about 23 miles west of Cleveland. People often ask me, what brought you to D.C.? I said, Ohio brought me to D.C. Uh, the things that were going on there compared with what's going on here in D.C. Um, and it's actually, um, I gravitated to D.C. Um, based upon something I was hearing a while in Ohio when I heard um, that D.C. Um, did not have a vote uh, in Congress, I thought it to be an injustice and started advocating for myself outside of the District of Columbia. But I believe all my roles have led me uh, here. Um, I was a history major at Morehouse College. I know Brother Skinner, you're at Howard, the Mecca. Um, but you get a sense of mission at, at certain HBCUs to give back and to do more, uh, to take the baton and run for it, that you bequeath something and that we have a responsibility to give back. And there's no better place to give back to black folk uh, than Washington, D.C. Well, look, look, I went to Howard and Tuskegee, but we know Morehouse men would put on earth to lead us. So we definitely appreciate y'all's commitment. And again, there's so many amazing, wonderful brothers come out of that place. And the fact that you've uh, shared and cast your lot in life to, to help direct our, our, our community in Washington, D.C., uh, we definitely appreciate and thank you. Thank you, brother. Like, again, to, to think so much and, and think uh, so highly of our community to literally every day wake up thinking about ways to make our, our affairs better. So can, can you kind of give us a, a little like an overview uh, of your, your role in, in the office and just, again, kind of give us a context again, uh, how um, you know important what you're doing and, and even how rare in some cases, and I'm, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I think that'd be a good way to give our, our listeners a, a perspective because what you're doing is amazing. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of serving the 700,000 plus residents of Washington, D.C. via the administration of Mayor Muriel Bowser for six years uh, this month. I originally um, joined as director of the Mayor's Office of Religious Affairs, which is also uh, unique when it comes to municipalities. Um, but last fall, um, I was tapped to be the director of African American Strategic Engagement, enhanced office of the mayor's office on african-american affairs joining my work as director still religious affairs with the work of director of the mayor's office on african-american affairs and also giving leadership to the commission on african-american affairs the mayor's interfaith council and the commission on fathers men and boys my team and i each and every day we wake up thinking what is going on in our city that black folk ought to know about um, you know that old saying, if a tree falls in the woods, no one hears it, um, doesn't make a sound. And there's so many great things, so many opportunities uh, that our people need to be aware of. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they do know the resources available to them to enhance that, to defeat that myth that there's no space or no place, that Chocolate City is, 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 is changing, excluding Black folk. We are here to say that there are things put in place that will uniquely help um, our people, and that's one of the tasks. And in addition, um, to help and build capacity 
and also being the mayor's eyes and ears in the community and the hands to see what are black folk in need of. So this is exciting uh, work. Oftentimes you go into meetings and, and, and people think you don't want to hear what they have to say, but I need to hear and we need to hear that there's no better way to serve our folk than listening to what they are saying, whether we like it or not. Awesome. And in, in that capacity, I, I think this is interesting with all the things that are happening in our community and even the issues of, you know, we just recently had the thing in, in Buffalo and, you know, specifically black people targeted uh, by these uh, uh, domestic terrorists. And I think sometimes, you know, and I, I'm gonna say, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm going to say this out loud. The fact that there's an office specifically, you know, geared to us as folks who've been in America so long and it's not lumped in with other groups who legitimately have their issues and legitimately should be served. The fact that you are specifically engaging in issues related to us as these descendants who have a very unique history in the United States, yeah, I think is really powerful. What are some of the things that you 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 see or deal with that actually uh, help you know you know you you know understand or better grasp that role to address us specifically? Like the fact you just just talked said Chocolate City, you know sometimes you got political folks even afraid to say those words. So I think the fact that you're you're bold in that statement in your office as it as it stands is bold in saying that we are a important constituency. You know, what are some of the things around that? Brother Skinner, um, I wasn't trying to appease you when I came on and said, I love black people. You cannot say I love black people and not say um, I love Chocolate City and bow down and, and, and give respect to it. it. It is necessary. The rich history here and the gifts um, that D.C. has given the entire world is no mistake. Um, that Mayor Bowser a couple years ago uh, officially named Go Go Music as the official music of Washington, D.C., one of our greatest ambassadors. But Go Go is not just music and a song. It is a culture. It's a lifestyle. It's a vibe. It's, it's a way of living and a way of thinking and also a, a way of addressing the issues that are important to our own community. So um, when we talk about the music, we talk about um, the culture as well. And we have to protect it as much as possible. We have to show some people, we'll get them to understand why they need to respect um, Go Go Music, Don't Mute DC, a wonderful campaign that that, that took um, um, off. It's a way of introducing people um, to Washington DC. So I, I think that that's a step, um, naming uh, a Go Go Music, but also uh, when the mayor makes investment that's in our arts and cultural. DC murals is so wonderful. Um, there's hardly a place that you can go in DC and not see one of these wonderful murals um, that tell the story of DC, that, is, that gives tribute um, to some of the icons that have come through this as a way of motivating and inspiring another generation and educating those who perhaps are, are new um, to um, our city. Uh, and it also is a way to make sure that we are employing um, those in our artist community who have also been hit um, during um, the pandemic. So I believe that everything um, that Mayor Bowser addresses doesn't just address one issue or problem, it's addressing a myriad of issues and giving relief where relief is needed. Well, look, I, I'm not gonna let you get away without giving a little bit more of the shout out because you, you started talking about Morehouse. Well, how did the, you know, I, I don't know if y'all call it the house. I know y'all got some nicknames, so I'm not going to the house. No, ba no, ba no bounds, <laughs> humbly, humbly. Uh, but you know, how did, uh, you know, attending the HBCU, one is uh, prestigious, is uh, Morehouse. How did that help prepare you for, for what you, you, you're you doing in your legacy here? Yeah, uh, I must say I have much respect um, for, for Howard as the church where I also serve Shiloh Baptist Church is down the street from Howard there in Shaw. Many of our members are graduates and you cannot talk about HBCUs in the district and not also lift up UDC. That that wonderful public institution, DC's public um, college doing wonderful things um, for residents in Washington, um, DC. Um, and, and, and so um, it's just the, the sense that you get when you attend an HBCU that you're, you're there not to leave, um, 
that institution just to go out and get a job. It is an experience, although we all said that you can go through Morehouse and not have Morehouse go through you. And I think that you can interchange that with this, any um, HBCU. Um, but the people that you come in contact with are the stories you hear. Now, I had the benefit of being a history major, uh, so I had no other choice but to think um, historically. Um, but the preparation I got there also existed in and outside the classroom. Um, I went to school with, with uh, uh, sons of college presidents and sons of, of preachers from around um, the, the, the country. Uh, I was coming from Ohio. My parents didn't have a high school diploma. My dad worked at General Motors. My mom um, worked in a, in a nursing home. I was a first generation college student. Um, but the teachers there and the administration taught me as if I had the blood of Dr. King running through my veins. And that sense of pride and joy and expectation and not being told no. Over the head of the students, we have the saying um, that Morehouse holds a crown that challenges us to grow tall enough to wear. When you touch that crown, you ought to hear voices that says higher, higher. That is the Black experience, to do the most with the little um, that you had, but always be called to go higher. Man, woo, bro, break it down, man. Look at here. Uh, I mean, look, I, this is the morning. I need this like coffee, bro. Go ahead. You, <laughs> look, look, I like it, but look, look or, 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 no chaser. I like it. This, this is how we need to do it. Okay, with that being said, you know, what do you see as some of the things that uh, you're empowering folks right now and in the future? I think, again, I perspective is a historian. Again, I'm, I'm an engineer by profession, so again, I'm very problematic on some of those classes. But literally, uh, your work and the, the the legacy that you're a part of and the legacy that you're actually uh, leaving, what do you see in the future? Where do you see uh, your work? And and you know what? And for our listeners that, that are in cities that don't have uh, a office of African American Affairs, maybe you can even speak to you know a bigger context of your work in the body politic of municipal governance and the the role you. Your, your office is an example of. I think that's an interesting. Thing. I can't help but think, um, because uh, later uh, today, on this Thursday, um, the mayor will be cutting of the ribbon on affordable housing. And then at that, she will also uh, announce the members of um, our Black Home Ownership um, Strike Force. Uh, she announced this initiative earlier this year when she unveiled her budget. It's one thing um, to talk about things historically. It's another thing uh, to try to address historical wrongs. Um, that's why people don't want you to mention CRT, critical race theory. I, and the mayor, uh, along with our, our deputy mayor, have rightly put their finger on the pulse and said that we need to do something to increase the prospects of Black home ownership in the district. So the, they're putting the, the money where their mouth is, and that is making sure um, that we think strategically on how we can increase Black home ownership. Um, it's all of our burdens to bear. Um, this thing has a history rooted in redlining, not only in the District of Columbia, um, but around um, the country. Um, but we're just not going to meet and talk about that. We're going to say, what can we do about it? Just recently, the mayor um, appointed um, our first director of the Office of Racial um, Equity uh, to make sure that our policies are reflective and inclusive and do not do further or additional damage um, to, to Black folk. Uh, a part of this, and we have to do some, some hard truth. This is one of the things that don't um, get uh, addressed, um, that there's, there's a reason why oftentimes property changes hands in our community. And one of the things that the mayor is doing with the Black Home Ownership Fund is putting money aside for legal services for those families who have been left um, home so they can think through that process. That's very um, important when it comes to maintaining um, homes uh, in Black families and, and also the ability to purchase homes um, down the road. Uh, and a part of it is also what my office will uh, be doing. I'm, I'm proud that we have convening um, power. Um, but this over the course of the summer, uh, we're going to be reaching out to recent college grads uh, and high school grads in D.C. and talk to them about how they can become black homeowners to this day. Um, my parents never talked to me about owning black 
owning a home, but we have an opportunity to talk to high school grads who are not necessarily going to college, but going into the workforce and college graduates, uh, particularly, you know, those from Howard and UDC on what it will take to own a home as they're thinking about unless they get an answer to the prayer and have their loans uh, forgiven. Um, thinking Amen. about um, the loans. This is a time to look at money management, and this is a time to think about their future. And we have an opportunity um, to get um, those who are in their 20s um, into homes. And I, I've been um, really excited about the number of young homeowners in Washington, D.C. That's a story that needs to be told. And they can get into home ownership. Uh, once their loans are, are forgiven, but also once someone approaches them and, and talks to them about home ownership and it becomes more um, than just a, a dream or, or something they heard about, we can take them from do dorms to home ownership. Yeah, I think your point, and I, you know, I, I've been a part of the, some of the conversations on reparations and, and again, I, you know, even, you know, I'm, I'm one, I'm kind of hardcore, so I'm not pro pro projecting it on you, but I think uh, I, as we, you know, those who pursue uh, HR 40 or some of these uh, remedies, that there are remedies that can be taken until we get our 40 acres in the check. And I do mean a check. We can get all the policies, get the policies right, cut the check. But I think what you're saying is very specific in talking to our, our needs as a Black community. And as a constituency, we deserve to have a focus placed on us. And the fact that, again, to be so thoughtful of the fact that oftentimes when our families are going through transition, we don't have the funds uh, or the forethought to say, hey, we need some legal help. You know, how do we address this? And, you know, and by the time it gets addressed, you know, people done lost all kinds of relationships. We get torn yeah. up and, and people get bitter. So I think, again, you know, being able to leverage your insight into us as a people and le using that understanding to help us and not hurt us. I think that's why I think there's people who study us and then they use what they study to hurt us to actually use what, you know, we've, we your, your exposure and understanding of our, of our people over time throughout history, as well as right now as policies coming up with remedies that actually will help us. So we don't have to wait for the federal uh, government, but literally uh, as we wait for statehood and we demand statehood, there's things that we can do. And I think, uh, that was super thought and, and you kind of tied it in. I think sometimes we get caught up in some type of generational chauvinism where somehow mm -hmm. it's one generation's yeah. versus the other. But I think the way you you pulled it together, we're, we're even talking about transitioning wealth. That that means there's generations that are, are participating. So we all need to be uh, have our hands on deck and anything that can in, uh, enhance or improve uh, that transition. I think it's, it's super powerful. So, I mean, again, I just want to say it's not lost on me that what you just said was um, demonstrative. It wasn't just rhetoric. And we can sometimes get caught up in that. Like, we can sound good. I, I, mm -hmm. it, I, Brenda, you probably will sound better than me. I, I always, you know, but humbly. Yeah, and I, and I must say, I give um, credit where credit is due. And that is to our mayor, Mayor Bowser, um, who, um, as a, 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 when she was younger, was able to purchase a home. And I've heard it, her say it time and time again, that her ability um, to purchase a home has allowed her later in life to make different decisions. But it began with home ownership, you know, and, and then her, her involvement um, uh, in DC, it stems from that decision. And so it's, it's, it's on her heart. She didn't need a study for this one. Um, no, she I, knew the impact it had for, on her life, and she believes that it can have a positive impact on the lives of others. So she is committed um, to getting Black folk um, in homes. Um, she enlisted me in my role as Director of Religious Affairs uh, to knock on the doors and talk uh, with houses of worship um, who have um, um, excess property. And that that can be de developed and used for affordable um, um, housing. Uh, and, and, and so this 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 focus on, on home ownership is something that's close to her heart. No, I did, did, you know, you just did, did that shout out with talking about our home ownership. I, I remember she was the ANC commissioner and uh, doing her thing. And you're right. I think that's an interesting nexus. We home ownership oftentimes inspires people to civil and enga civic engagement. And I think yes. as, as you're even speaking to, you're speaking to our, our engagement as a, a community 
how do we advocate for ourselves and get agency? And I think some of the things you just mentioned shows the intersectionality of home ownership, having a voice, setting uh, goals financially. Uh, with that being said, what do you see as some of the other things that you think are key? Because uh, I think the, the wealth gap and in and in, in making sure we have home ownership and again, keeping this city as amazing as it is, uh, what, uh, what other things would you, you say are, are key in that area? Education is key. Um, education has to be a focus of ours. Um, that's why um, during the pandemic, it was important to make sure whatever form we can, that we continue to offer and to provide our children education. Education, um, we know, is, is a key uh, to our advancement and giving people opportunity. Education and giving people chances. Notice I didn't say a chance because people deserve more than one chance. If I had only one chance um, after uh, not um, doing something, uh, perhaps um, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Go ahead, go um, ahead, go ahead. I'm, there I'm you grateful go. for the chances that I have. One of my mentors, uh, Mary Wright Edelman, when I worked for her, the Children's Defense Fund, said in the United States, children have unequal childhoods uh, in America. You, you cannot expect um, uh, all of our children um, to 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 have the same opportunities as someone somewhere else. I always thought about the fact um, that when we put a, a a premium on SAT scores, um, yet still there were families who were who were putting um, their children in classes to help improve their SAT scores. Um, there was something wrong with that that whole model. Um, but our children deserve a first-rate education, a world-class education. And, and I believe that that's what Amir Bowser um, has promoted. And, and that's what we have in Washington, um, D.C. There are families um, now as, as good as, as some um, private schools are uh, in our area. Um, there are schools in D.C. that compete um, with, with the, the best of them. And in some cases, you know, um, supersede um, them. When I think of, of, of the former Wilson High School, I'm going to butcher the, the new name. When I think about Duke Ellington, when I, I think about Banneker, and when I, I think about um, our middle schools um, and our, our, our teachers here, our, our educators doing a wonderful thing and how they've had um, to, to hold in line during um, the pandemic, um, ensuring that our children will not fall behind. Um, I heard um, uh, that Benjamin Mays once said that those of us who start behind in the great race of life must run faster than the person ahead or forever remain behind. We owe it to our children to give them education. So I'm, I'm glad also for a program that allows um, parents uh, to begin giving and putting ma money away for a child's education uh, down the road. I'm glad um, for the, uh, uh, the, the in-state tuition afforded to D.C. Uh, uh, residents when they go out of the, um, the, the area. Uh, but education is the key in giving people opportunities. And we invested a lot um, in programs that help the young people who have been justice uh, involved. We all make mistakes. We teach that the kids on their first day. We put erasers on top of pencils because they will make a mistake. And children should be able to make mistakes. And we as adults sometimes make mistakes. But let's give our people an, an opportunity. Let's give them another chance, just like um, everyone has been afforded. Wow. Okay, so we got the education. We're dealing with the wealth gap. Uh, what about, you know, some of the issues on safety? I mean, I, I want to make sure that we give, uh, you know, full, you know, round, well, well-rounded uh, conversation about some of the things that your, your office is doing. Um, and you hit the arts. I think sometimes we don't understand how important that is. And I think you really kind of pulled that in through the cultural lens, as well as helping us understand that we were part of a, 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 a a level of continuity that that has extended before us and will continue on after us with the culture uh mm -hmm. as we, we kind of wrap things up are there any things you would say that are critical to you know as we move forward that may not uh have been addressed you know you, you had mentioned earlier um some of the violence that has impacted our, our country all aware of what took place um and, and in buffalo and, and what took place um in texas and there are, are some who you know who take pause and say but what about that which we face here um in dc 
But at the heart of it all um, still is, is our infatuation and access to guns. Amir Bowser is, is one who just flat out said that she does not like guns. And we're trying to keep guns out of the hands of those um, who don't need it. Um, and we have several people leading the way. Uh, Linda Harley Harper, um, who's leading um, our gun violence prevention uh, program is wonderful. Um, the, the, the Deputy Mayor of Public Safety and Justice, our ONE's office, Office on Neighborhood and Safety and en Engagement, is doing a wonderful job. We just recently uh, announced 202 for Peace, um, a summer um, initiative that's also going to uh, address um, our, our gun violence. And I mentioned the programs that we have for those who have a justice involved. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rev. Appreciate you all well, the work you're doing. Stanley. So humbly, humbly, again, you know, we want to give you your flowers while you're here. Thank you, brother, and thank you for just contributing to something in a way that, again, we probably don't even think about it or even see it, but I'm, I'm glad you see us and with the work that you're doing, I, I definitely it shows. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, good brother. Thank and you, I brother Skinner. Leave, I love black people. I love black people with you, and I always end it with I am because we are, and we definitely are because of you. So thank you, good brother. Thank you. Thank you. This is I Love Black People Radio on HUR Voices, Sirius XM Channel 141. I Love Black People is more than a radio show. I Love Black People is a call from our ancestors to protect us from racial profiling all across the world. Go to iloveblackpeople.com and become a member today. Membership empowers you to live fearlessly and protect black people globally from racism and xenophobia. Join us today and become a member of our global network with an online global green book with black-owned and black-friendly businesses to protect you and your community. Membership is free, and with you, we will become 10 million strong worldwide. I am because we are.